we very much appreciate it. Um, just, just to be clear, this is a panel interview. It is not a debate. Um, and so uh, the panelists will be asking questions, and you'll be certainly answering those. As it's not a debate, we would ask that you do not refer to your other candidates in any kind of negative way. Um, that's not why we're here. And so, uh, and in fact, it will count against you when the votes come if, uh, if, if you act to. And if that does happen as well, um, I, at my discretion, I can give time to the other person to reply um, to whatever negative thing that they said. Um, but this is similar to a job interview, so, so, uh, so we'd ask that you respect that. Um, I'm the moderator, Attorney uh, Stephen Stubbs, and, uh, and it's my job to, to moderate, to direct, uh, to make sure that time is kept so that we can uh, get through everything timely and efficiently. Um, the format is that each one of you will be given a minute and a half uh, for your uh, introductions, and you can say anything you'd like in that time. Um, and then, uh, and then the panelists, uh, in turn, will be given 30 seconds to ask a question, and you'll be given one minute to answer. And we're not doing follow-up questions. Um, there are plenty of panelists, and we need to get through those. They can either ask uh, one individual, both individual questions, or a question to go to both of you. Um, and so. If, uh, if you don't mind, uh, we'll go ladies first, if that's okay. And so, um, Ms. Uh, Kirsten Nias, yes. did I say that do correctly? Need, do we need to use the microphone? Please do, it's being recorded. Uh, one and a half minutes to, um, to introduce yourself. It's turned on, yes. Hi, I'm Christine Kirsten Nias. Um, I've been an attorney for about 20 years. I have been in the Las Vegas area for 12 years, have been with the Attorney General's office for eight years and was with the City of Henderson for three years. Um, while I was at the Attorney General's office, I was the Regional Chief Deputy Attorney General, responsible for 83 attorneys and um, a bureau's worth of government agencies, including taxation, business and industry, corrections, HHS. I'm most known at the AG's office for defending the smoking ban in 2007 there was an initiative on the ballot to ban smoking indoors. So there was a challenge brought to that voter initiative in the end of 2007, beginning of 2008, and I defended the constitutionality of the indoor smoking ban. I'm also well known for having taken away the medical license for Dr. Deepak Desai. So that was one of the first actions that was taken against Dr. Desai in the endoscopy scandal. I have a strong background in business transactions, began my legal career defending uh, accountants and auditors with the big six firm at the time of Ernst & Young, which I now think is a big four. Um, ran my own practice for a little bit in New York while my children were small, did a fair amount of criminal defense and real estate transactions. So I have a broad background and I'm looking forward to talking to you and answering any questions. Thank you very much. And Mr. Smith. All right, I'm Judge Smith from District Court Department 8. I've been here since 1982. I came and I worked in the private practice and then I was a public defender and I defended indigent people uh, for about three years. I went to the district attorney's office to prosecute. I have prosecuted or defended uh, nearly 60 jury trials. I uh, was in, I was a volunteer and I am a volunteer at the uh, Boulder Dam Area Council of the Boy Scouts of America. I was on the Speaker's Bureau uh, for the Public Education Committee for the American Cancer Society. I've been a member of the Attorney Disciplinary Board uh, from the Nevada Bar Association. I'm a member of the Nevada, Utah, and Montana Bar Associations uh, and Nevada State Trial Lawyers Association. I was a, uh, a public defender again for three years, DA for seven years. I was a Justice of the Peace for 16 years and I have uh, been a district court judge for the last five years. I have nearly 600 hours of extra judicial education. You have 20 seconds if you like. <laughs> um, I have uh, tried cases. I have defended murderers on death row, and I have prosecuted murderers on death row. I've, try I've tried hundreds uh, or thousands of misdemeanor cases. I know what the public defenders will do and why they do it. I know what the DAs will do and why they do it. Uh, a tough one to Thank you very much. We will start with you, 
with our panel, and we made it all the way through, so we start with the same person this time. So, Ms. Uh, Ms. Gardner. Um, well, I remember when you ran against Kelly Slane one, and I was just curious as to the difference between being a justice of the peace and being a district court judge. Which one you enjoy the most, and why? Justice of the peace, you deal more with people, and you can deal with the people and the problems they have, and you can solve problems. When you get to district court, you're dealing with the attorneys and uh, law and motion calendars and, and things. I enjoy both. I don't have a preference. Do you have other questions? Sure. Mr. Why do you want to be a judge? I'll try to make this brief, but um, when I was in college, I spent a semester in China, in Beijing, in the early 80s, when it was a very regimented society, and very communist. Um, people there, we had to wear badges with our names and numbers on them. People were afraid to talk to us because their employers or neighbors could report them. Um, it it was that it was it was a pivotal moment for me and sent me to law school. And then as I've been through law school um, and working in the system, I think the next step to ensuring our judicial system and our constitution is is being a judge. And really, the front lines for that and the constitution, our way of life is so important to me, and that's why I want to be a judge. Just as a personal side, the judge for whom I work also lived in China and speaks Chinese. She'll have to get together with her. <laughs> Miss Boston. Good afternoon. Um, I want to start with Judge Judge Smith. Hi. Hi. Okay. My question is one question in three parts. Uh, describe some changes you would like to see made in the district court based on you know, the types of cases considered with respect to the opinion of the way that the court operates? Changes I'd like to see in the district court would probably be more um, alternative dispute resolution. I, I've been to school and have been or, or, uh, certified as a, a mediator. I would like to see mediation in the criminal area as well to try to solve the problems. I don't want uh, I wouldn't want everybody in prison to be drug users because there's a way to fix that and if we can do that with mediation, that would cut down on our trials. And we need to stop the trials so much. I mean, it used to be that we'd do one trial and then maybe next week I'd do another trial. Now it's we're picking a jury, the jury's out, we're picking another jury for the next trial. So. Question for Ms. Christina. Um, well, ask the question I wanted to ask. <laughs> and that was why you wanted to be addressed that that was the answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we'll get to Karen in just a moment. So, Ms. Babcock. I just want to clarify, when you're talking about the role of the community, you're talking about as, as far as uh, services, rehabilitation services, that type of thing. Well, I'm a strong believer in drug court, and I know Judge Smith has been, has been pivotal in that issue. Um, but drug court is very important when I think when you've got addicts and people with addiction issues, that you've got to treat the underlying issues in order to get to the criminal behavior. There's got to be accountability for their criminal behavior, but if you don't treat the underlying disease, I think then your, your rate of recidivism is just so high. I started, I started the first justice court, drug court, under Judge Elaine, and he asked me to do that. It was the first one in the United States at that time. And I think that drug court is most effective if the people really want to change. If they don't want to change, it doesn't matter what a judge does, it can't, you can't force them off of the drugs. But if you work with them, 
You don't revoke them the first time they get dirty, but they're going to fall off the wagon generally. But you work with them, you work with them, you work with them. I've had many, many graduates come to me in tears thanking me for having a justice court drug court. That way it does, didn't get to district court. Thank you very much. Uh, Ms. Karen Skin. Good afternoon. Sorry, I keep forgetting I talk so loud. Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us here today and allowing us to scrutinize you so publicly. I would like each of you to give me your thoughts on judiciary efficiency. We have uh, the opportunity that we can take the, our trials. See, the charge to the court is, is to protect society and manage your courtroom. And you've got to take your trials and you've got to work with the people. Now, there is a case that, that stops us from uh, uh, assisting in the negotiation of cases. But the reason you negotiate cases, when I ran against Kelly Slate, I did a, a uh, study that if you were robbed on that day would be sure and we've got more trial time now if you were robbed on that day if you did not negotiate your cases if you went to trial on every case with the number of hours that we have to try cases you would get a, a trial in 75 years now if you have a, in the evidence so you negotiate what you can to try to resolve the ones you can and you go to trials on the ones that you can't resolve thank you I think the most important thing with judicial efficiency is having an informed court. I've been in front of um, judges at times who hadn't read some of the pleadings, and then you spend an inordinate amount of time educating judges. I think it's very important that um, the judges read everything that's put before them, that the research is done, that they come to the bench knowing what the issues are, able to ask pertinent questions so that there's not repetitive arguments, um, so that everybody can get, get to the point and get the case moved on. You mean do their jobs? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Miss Knight, if, if you could get the microphone, that would be awesome. Okay, my question um, was for both kind of in its own ways. Where, um, where is your stance with recusing yourself, what, at what position do you find to recuse yourself from a certain case? Um, to what extent, what, do you, what are your beliefs in that type of system? And then, uh, Arnold Smith, I would like you to further explain with your highly controversial issue that happened this past year and kind of give you a chance to explain yourself um, about that also that issue as, as far as quitting a, um, the current case. Okay. Mr. Smith, you can start. You want me to start? Please. Okay. Uh, the Supreme Court has made it very clear that we as judges are to hear our cases and we, we aren't to recuse at the drop of a hat because, um, because someone doesn't like us. Um, the case that you're talking about is the one with, with uh, Mark Hutchison and he was, some of that information that they had was not accurate. But the problem was that my relationship to my religion and Mark Hutchison, even though it was inaccurate, got bigger than the case. And I reviewed that with our chief judge. I said, what do you think I should do? And I got on a, a three-way conversation with uh, Mr. Hutchison, uh, the defense attorney, which is Jerry Gillock, and myself, and we talked about it. And I said, you know what, I don't like talking on the telephone because it's not so come in on Tuesday, file what you guys want to file, and, Time and we'll have a discussion. Time Sorry. Um, as far as recusals, from, from my perspective, um, the only time that I would recuse myself is if I had had a personal involvement with the matter before me, if I had represented the, the plaintiff or the defendant in my private practice, or there was some personal relationship that I felt would uh, not give a fair, would, would not allow me to be fair, that there may be a, a perception of bias. Thank you. If I can say something real quick. Disclosure is more important than recusal. If you disclose to the attorneys. Sorry. Stop. Hello. 
Uh, this question is for both candidates. What are the major influences in your life and why? I'm sorry, Carson Nice, could you start with that? What are the major influences in your life and why? Uh, I have several major influences and I'll try to do this quickly. My grandparents were all Italian immigrants. They came here at young ages while they were in their late teens, early 20s to start a different life for themselves and for their family. They were very hard workers, very um, determined to speak the English language, very determined that their children and grandchildren should, you know, be, have a better life than they had. Um, my maternal grandfather was actually in the Sicilian salt mines, was sold into the salt mines when he was six years old. He managed to get himself out at 12 and lived just an incredible, demanding life. And it, it's that kind of dedication and hard work that um, makes me appreciate the U.S. as well as my time that I spent in China, just the opportunities here. So it's really my family and the United States that are the biggest influences on me. Thank you very much. Mr. Smith. Thank you. Uh, my, my wife's grandfather, my children's grandfather, um, is a member of the 31ers. Uh, Las Vegas has been very uh, good to me. Uh, my family is probably my wife, my three boys, are the greatest influence that I have in my life. Um, I love them to death. I would do anything for my family. We elect judges um, to be tough on crime and compassionate, but wise enough with experience to know when to be tough and when to be compassionate. Um, and it's it is something that comes with experience um, to know, do I, under the facts of this particular case, do I be tough or do I be compassionate? And that's the influence you have is just your experience. I've defended criminals that have confessed to me. They deserve the right. I've won more trials as a public defender than other public defenders. And more trials than I lost. I went over to the DA's office and I prosecuted cases. Well, my question got asked. Sorry, you asked that. Expressed that education could probably be closely attributed to a lot of the crime that um, we're being faced with. And I guess that could apply to a lot of other areas, even some areas, and the decisions or decisions that have been made. So, what would you uh, tackle first to change that? Because, just to give you some uh, a quick background, I know that in our schools we still have a problem of overcrowding, we have teachers that are underprepared. Um, some fantastic teachers, but with classrooms with uh, several different intellectual challenges. So, um, how, as judges, would you suggest or give advice to our community to rise up from the bottom? We could be. I'm going to start with Mr. Smith this time. You know, we spend too darn much money um, prosecuting cases and putting people in prison and imprisonment. It, perhaps if we focus more of our energies on families, family values, and education, that's where the kids would stay out because the kids are turning to gangs, and the gangs they think that are in their best interest are not. And more often than not, you get a, a young uh, African American boy that comes in front of you, and it's heartbreaking to sentence him to prison that committed a robbery, but you have to because he's used a gun, and they should be more worried about the tuxedo and it's homework than at what caliber of gun you should get using a crime. So we have to educate the families. We've got to start there and that would help them then overcome this need to, to have some male figure telling them what to do and how to, how to get things accomplished. Thank you. Ms. Christy Dice. While as a judge you don't have any ability to legislate or really affect education, I think what's most important is outreach on the part of the judges to the schools. One of the most um, important school trips that my daughter took was a trip to justice court. And she still talks about it to this day, how she got to sit with the judge and sit in the jury seats and um, hear the judge. And it was a female judge and how she was proud that there was a woman up there and that she, she really enjoyed the system. I think that if 
the people who are in the judiciary can help out and reach out as mentors, as um, you know, educators, and, and, and invite the children to their classrooms that you end up then with a better educated um, populace. Ms. Carroll. Thank you. This is directed to both of the candidates. Thank you. What kind of expectation would you set in your courtroom for progression of a trial that may just be lingering too much to a complex case? Complex case. We could start with Ms. Gerson. Thank you. I think that it's very important in the courtroom that you establish your authority, that you establish your timelines, that there be, um, that, that you're prepared as in the courtroom side and that you're, you demand that the attorneys who appear in front of you are also prepared so that you're not ending up with a long string of continuances or other issues that are going to delay the trial. You are, uh, people have their constitutional rights, there are rights involved, so you have to be careful not to trample on those rights, but also run an efficient courtroom. Be there on time, start your calendar on time, move through your calendar, move through your motions, get your jurors in, and be efficient. Mr. Smith. Uh, efficiency in the court is one of the, the most difficult portions because if you're in a a murder trial that's that's gone over a week or two you have other criminal cases coming and so we have a system in, in our court that we send our cases to overflow and I've been in the top uh, three or four uh, judges that if their case resolves my case were to resolve I would go to overflow and pick up the overflow trial from another department it is important that we get those trials done do the trials and be there I mean one of the biggest complaints I have is I start early. Uh, when you take a break in my courtroom, if I say an hour, you better be back at 50 minutes because I go, I start, I'm up on the bench. And I give them a full day in court. Some judges, unfortunately, don't give them a full day in court. Um, I, I start my trials at 9.30, we'll go till 5.30. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Brooks. Thank both of you for uh, being here today. Open yourself up publicly to our panel. Uh, first question is for uh, Judge Smith. Um, you had a case that was in the news. Uh, it was your, your Perez case. That there's video out there and uh, people were talking about that uh, you were unfair to him. You said it's, you know, bail so high and then everything got overturned over to the Supreme Court, uh, Nevada State Supreme Court. Could you expound a little bit on that and uh, let us know why you made the decision that you, that you made in that case? I'll tell you my exact thought process. When I had Mr. Perez coming from me, he had continued the trial three times. Uh, and he walked in a calendar call with one of the top criminal attorneys in Las Vegas, John Mommett, and fired him on the spot, which caused another year or two continuance in his trial. So he's kind of manipulating the system. I, uh, that, that thought went through my mind, why? And so I said, well, wait a minute, what's your custody status? Because I haven't seen it, that was said in some, someone else's court. And I find out, we have a hearing, and it's on, on the record, which they didn't really cover as well as they should, but um, I find out that he is a four-time convicted felon, he uses 16 different names, he has three different social security numbers, and he has other convictions for, he's, he's a, eligible for habitual criminal. I know as a public defender, the way to win is if you can't win the trial and the fact you continue, you put more time between the arrest and the trial. And I'll tell you what, um, he just got to continue it again in the other court. Thank you. I'm, I'm sorry, but there are time limits for that. Oh, no, no, no. That's that, that a question for Ms. Christine Knight. I do, Ms. Christine Knight. I, I got a question for you. You were. Uh, Heading up the mortgage fraud division for the state of Nevada, you. Uh... I was I was not the head of mortgage fraud division. I was the regional chief and the head of the bureau of public affairs. Um, Russell Smith is the head of the criminal mortgage fraud unit. I was the head of the civil unit that included the mortgage lending division. So we did the civil mortgage fraud cases and the mortgage license revocations 
of, of the agents and brokers. I, I and, but I also did, I was in Mr. Smith's unit for a period of time doing some criminal work as well, but I wasn't the head of that unit. Right, and during, during your tenure while you were over there, were you able to help out any veterans that might have had been victim to the mortgage fraud that ran rampant throughout our campus? Um, we're very focused on victims. It wasn't one of our questions to ask if you were a veteran, so it really was that the people who were coming to us, it, it, it turned out the people who were really victimized were people who tended to be less educated and people who were very desperate. So it, it, it's, it, you know, there was all types of people who were, who were being victimized. And the really key thing for me is to hold people accountable who are taking advantage of these people. These people were desperate, were going to lose their homes. So we didn't really screen people as far as their, their veteran status, but we, we, we certainly wanted to help whoever had come to us. This is my last chance to uh, to get this correct. <laughs> so, Doctor, <laughs> Doctor, it's pressure. Do you correct? Yes, I did it. <laughs> she said I did. She just said I got it. Stop. <laughs> I didn't even say that. That was a you. Uh, our jails and uh, prisons are overcrowded, and it seems that America has the highest number of prisoners per capita in the world. Why is that, and what can be done about it? Mr. Smith, you can start that. Why, why do we have the highest per capita prisons? Uh, probably have the higher uh, per capita crimes committed. You don't try, you don't want people to go to prison for being under the influence or using drugs. Um, our prisons are there, and we have to use them uh, for the serious offenders. Very often, uh, people will use drugs when they're on probation. If, you're, if you get probation and you, and you continue to commit felonies, like using drugs, what alternative do you have but to put them back in prison? And the, the, uh, Alternative to that is how do you solve that? Um, obviously, it's not send enough people to, to or not send more people to prison, but use probation. The problem is we're having so many more violent crimes that um, the prisons are being full of violent crimes, but they should be less full of drug-related offenses. Hi, um, I think the reason we have so much more crime here is just the nature of Las Vegas. I mean, it attracts all types of people who want to come, you know, on their last chance or their last time and they come and they, I think they think they're anonymous a lot of times and do things that they wouldn't normally do in a community where there's lots of family and lots of connections. As far as, as, as keeping people or getting our prison population down, when I was, I was the city attorney for the city of Henderson, the city of Henderson has um, three criminal courts as well. And what we did on the prosecution side was really use drug court, and also veterans court. We would, you know, had our a special attorney who was a veteran himself assigned to the veterans court so that he would understand the issues, the post-traumatic stress issues, the issues that are affecting a veteran who comes back and commits some crimes to see if we could divert that person from being incarcerated and, and, and use some other method. I think that to manage our population, we need to look at more of those types of programs like drug court, like Veterans Court, and un address the underlying time. issues. Thank you so much. We finished our entire panel in time, and we very much appreciate you being here.